plural noun proposition papers. Today we're going to look at goal setting as a sample of writing a plural noun proposition paper. Keep in mind, a lot of what we do with our plural noun proposition papers are, are really the starting point for other things, whether it's an email, whether it's uh, goal setting, whether it's a paper, whether it's the beginning of your debate. This is the, the structure. And so, and especially when you look at something like goal setting, well, you have to have some kind of structure. You have to have some kind of format. I've done a lot of different types of formal goal setting, uh, Gantt goals and uh, the types of goals you, you do for business proposals and sales meetings and, and that kind of a thing. And they, they all start off the same way. They look exactly like plural noun proposition papers. And then sometimes you actually have to present your goals as something formal. Maybe it's a, a presentation or a proposal or you're in front of a, a board or an elder meeting. And so these are things that uh, you need to, to formulate in, in, in a clear, concise structure. Um, and the plural noun proposition format or paper is a great way to accomplish that. And so in goal setting, maybe your ultimate desire is to just write this on a chalkboard or a white erase board or maybe just a sheet of paper and it's just for your eyes only and that's okay. But you still need to go about the same process. And so whether it's a big, hairy, audacious goal, we call those big dreams, right? or just a, a smart goal where they're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, uh, they're relevant, and then they're timely. Doesn't matter what kind of goal it is, now we get to kind of the, the structure behind it. And so again, we're looking at determining the proposition of our paper. Uh, what is the proposition of your goal? What goal are we talking about? Today, we're gonna look at a spiritual goal or spiritual goals. We're going to compose an outline, uh, prepare the body of the paper, the supporting evidence or facts or, uh, you know, the, the meat. And then we're going to write an introduction and then finally formulate the conclusion. So where do we begin? We, we begin with brainstorming. So for me, I wanted to think of something spiritually. I want to grow spiritually. And specifically, I was thinking of a, a typical junior high student or typical high, stu high school students. Like, what does that mean? exactly to grow spiritually. And if I were to ask you, all right, write down a piece of paper, brainstorm some ideas, I'm not even sure that you could come up with that because it's actually not that easy of a, of a question to answer. And so sometimes in your brainstorming, we actually will, will ask questions like, okay, well, what are things I can control myself spiritually versus maybe God working through me, the Holy Spirit, or, or even my parents or somebody who's discipling me it's like okay so you know how is this working um what way do i want to grow spiritually is this like a holiness thing or maybe it's a uh, it's activity oriented being baptized joining a bible study going on a mission trip um, maybe it's there's action steps there's things that i need to do to grow spiritually i need to you know go to the church more often, hear the gospel. I need to read more. I need to memorize more, meditate more. You know, there's action steps that I need to do and partake in. So where do I begin and how do I grow spiritually? So we're writing all this stuff down. We're, we're brainstorming, we're trying to figure out, maybe there's a verse, maybe there's one verse in particular that really calls you to action. Colossians 3, put on, right? Or Ephesians 6, you know, put on the armor of God. And, and so it's like, all right, these are the you know, the different steps I'm going to do to grow spiritually by putting the armor of God type of a thing, or in Colossians 3, by putting on these three things, by putting off these three things. So I chose to go with Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is a foundational verse, not only for me, but for our school as well. In Psalm 1, just the beginning couple of verses says, it says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he will meditate day and night. And so for me, that's what I wanted to anchor in on. Psalm 1, we're going to anchor on those. Built into that were, were three propositions that I could take and say, okay, 
If I adhere to these three things, I will grow spiritually. The Bible promises it to me. There's blessings of being like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in street season. So I will be strong when trials and temptations come my way. There's a future blessing for me, an eternal blessing. There's also a, re a warning. Beware of, of the wicked. And, and if you follow the path of wicked, then you will be like a, a withering leaf that, that will flow away and will be like chaff and burn up. So I've got a great goal. I've got a great proposition. I've got three key points to follow. Now I've got to put those points into specific statements, right? So three ways that will help me grow spiritually this year are beware of outside counsel. The opening of Psalm 1 says beware um, or blessed is man who does not walk, who does not stand, who does not seat or sit, right? Who doesn't walk with the wicked, stand with the sinners, sit in, in the seat of mockers. So that's one of the ways that I can grow and do better uh, spiritually and so in my goal that's my first goal what's the supporting uh, statements or what is the supporting facts or what are the supporting um, other verses that I might use of beware of outside counsel well we know that that misery loves company right we we know that the, the, the wicked like to spurn on more wickedness and so that's why we have to beware of outside counsel Outside counsel can can be dangerous. The second aspect is delight in the law of the Lord that, that we need to to well what is the law of the Lord? The law of the Lord has many different meanings that has to do with with the precepts, the testimonies, the scriptures, the Bible, the gospel, right? So God's holy word is what I need to delight in. So I've got a couple supporting sentences that I can use for that. Uh, maybe there's specific books in the Bible that I want to read, specific verses that I want to memorize, and then meditate on it day and night. So in my paper, I probably have to define what meditation means, right? Most people don't know or understand meditation. They think of meditation as this new age thing of clearing your mind, making everything quiet. You don't think about anything, and you just sit there in silence. That's not what biblical meditation is. Biblical meditation is actually focusing, hard focus, processing as the Bereans, examining the scriptures to see how do I apply it, to see if it's so, to contemplate the deep things of God so that we can then go and live a holy and God-honoring life. And so these are the three ways that that in setting these goals that I can grow spiritually this year. Now, there might be a, a, another uh, desire that you have. Let's just say you're, you're, you're going to write a paper or you're going to set goals with, with sports. And, and you want to be a better baseball player. And you know what? Again, you got to start with your brainstorming. And I don't know what a better baseball player means to you. Maybe that's a team thing. Maybe it's an individual thing. And so you've got to start by writing that on a piece of paper. And so here's an example. Another example is the first way I, I want to become a better baseball player is by practicing more this year. The second way I want to become a better baseball player is by making the all-star team. The third way I want to be a better baseball player is by winning state. And so each one of those statements then has to have supporting evidence, right? So I can become a better baseball player by practicing more this year. What does that mean? Maybe it's lifting weights. Maybe it's have a personal trainer. Maybe it's uh, your nutrition. Maybe it's having mental mindset. Maybe it's practicing more with the coach, with the team, with a couple guys. These are your supporting evidences. Uh, your supporting, uh, you know, st statements that will help win the argument for you. The second way you want to become a better baseball player maybe is by being an all-star. But you got to understand, first you got to make the team. Then you gotta you gotta become a starter. Then you gotta be one of the best players in the league. Maybe then from all star you go to all all area. Maybe all even all state. Third way to become better baseball players by winning state by actually winning a team oriented a, accomplishment and achievement. But that that's the desire for for this person to becoming a better baseball player is actually winning state. So individually. 
the accomplishments wouldn't mean much if they didn't win the team achievement. So these are just a couple examples of how we use a uh, plural noun proposition to get to our, our goal setting. We, we use them in the brainstorming, we use them in the outlining, we use them in the structure, and then we use them in the action steps. That's our supporting uh, evidence. We use them in benchmarks. You know, hey, we have some timelines, right, in order to achieve these goals. And so if you were asked, well, you know, what is your goal of becoming a better student? You would use a plural noun proposition uh, format in order cons to construct your goals.